Okay, good to have you back for the next uh, class session. Uh, again, there are a little few loose ends to tie up from my last session. I mentioned schools in there. Uh, the establishment of schools should be left to the local church. If they feel there's a need for one, they will work to establish it. They will provide the teachers for it. They will secure the location, the building, or whatever. Uh, if the local church does not feel that they need a school, that's not an institution we should be starting in another country. They're simply too much involved with licensing, uh, dealing with government officials, with everything else. Now, one time, yeah, it was great. Back in the days when Zimbabwe was Rhodesia and uh, the colonial government was desperate to try and get schools out into the uh, uh, bush areas, uh, they were quite willing to work with anyone and helpful and everything else. That's not the case anymore, I don't think, anywhere in the world. And so for that reason, schools, as well as the properties they might need, should be left to the local church as the determining factor. Uh, our school in Colombia is run by Colombians. All the teachers are Colombians. Uh, uh, I work as our school psychologist uh, part-time down there. We do have a Colombian uh, young lady that's coming up that I have been training. Uh, to take my place. She finished her degree in uh, psychology in the university and now she's uh, working there. Still kind of inexperienced, but I'm working with her and she's gaining experience and little by little she's doing more and more of what I once would have done. And so the school is a Colombian operation. They manage it. Uh, they decided to uh, keep it in part because it makes uh, the church building useful. The church building is being used all week, every single day, not just simply, you know, once or twice or three times a week. Uh, for an hour or two meeting. So they thought it was good stewardship and they did it and they provided for it, which shows it can be done. <laughs> if the local church feels a ministry is essential, uh, if it's critical, they'll make the sacrifices and come through with it. And then again, we can help. So I've helped by serving without pay as their school psychologist for several years now. But uh, as quickly as possible, they'll be taking over that aspect of the ministry as well. So that should be uh, left as a local uh, initiative, uh, schools as well as camps and uh, uh, church buildings and everything of that nature. Today I want to deal with missionary national relationships and how we interact. Now that's an incredibly complex area again. Uh, we could spend uh, days or weeks or months or <laughs> a whole class on that topic because it is such a difficult issue. The reason it is so difficult, remember all that stuff we talked about, about intercultural communication? <laughs> That's like intercultural communication complications on steroids because it's not just simply showing up and being there for a little while where they're gonna, yeah, we're gonna put up with these crazy Americans because they're gonna be here two weeks and they're gonna be gone and we'll enjoy them and you know, like going to the zoo and seeing the monkeys or something like that, we'll have fun watching them, but then they're gone. When you're there working, uh, you're on that day-to-day -day interaction with them. Uh, at least in some scenarios, you're going to be in the position of, uh, say, an authority, uh, especially in the early days when the churches is getting are getting started. And that complicates the matters uh, tremendously because it's one thing if you're just a visitor. It's another thing if you're trying to work together. And then it's another thing still if you're trying to do the job where you're responsible for making sure things get done uh, and yet you're trying not to offend people and uh, uh, give reason to for somebody to feel maybe uh, uh, not appreciated or or worse yet abused or something by the way that we're uh, dealing with them and so all of that comes into play the way that an American would manage a business uh, and manage employees is certainly radically different from the way a Colombian would manage employees and manage a business. Um, in many parts of the world, your employee might not make much salary, but they depend upon you and you would be expected uh, to cover cost if they have uh, an illness in the family, uh, uh, something unusual happens or something like that, a family member dies or whatever. Uh, the boss often steps in and says, you know, here, I'll cover that for you. Uh, it's sort of an informal arrangement. It's maybe a little bit of a uh, remnant from when the Latin American countries had uh, sort of a feudalistic society, uh, but it's still very common. And uh, those are the types of things you have to take into consideration. Colombian labor laws are very different from American ones. For example, in June, you have to pay them an extra 50% salary. They call that the prima. Uh, 
prima prima can mean a prize or it can mean a, a cousin actually but in this case it means sort of like a prize and uh, it's uh, just sort of to cover some of those extra expenses that they have uh, then in December you're expected to give them an entire month's salary as a prima so you start to pay this guy and say, well, I've got to pay this much. Okay, well, then they come in and say, well, uh, but you also have to pay this kafam. Well, that's kind of like a recreational thing where they can take their kids to uh, a basketball court or a soccer field or maybe a swimming pool in your town or something like that. So that's a that's a extra fee. And then you have, uh, of course, the health care, which uh, we have up here but down there too. Well, that's an extra fee. And then you have uh, their pension or retirement. Well, that's an extra fee. So you start paying someone and you wind up paying them double or triple <laughs> what their actual salary is. If you don't take in that into consideration, you're behind the eight ball quickly. Uh, all of those things, too, come into play as to how we deal with people. Uh, it's very difficult to manage others without causing offense. And uh, if you do that as an American, invariably there'll be times when unintentionally uh, somebody's very upset with you. So those are things that come into play when we try to deal with uh, people in other cultures. So how do we do it? Well, uh, first of all, you're better off not starting out too soon after you get to the mission field. You won't understand the way things work. You won't understand their local laws. You won't understand the customs on how people exercise authority and, and how they interact with people. And so if you can avoid any employee uh, in the early uh, years that you're there, you're far better off. Uh, you know, it's one thing you pay a taxi cab and you jump in the cab and you go downtown, you give him his fare and that's it. Uh, but when you're starting to employ someone on a regular basis, that's very, very complicated and very, very difficult. So try to avoid it and then when you do get to the point where you have to do it you are you will be far better off if you can keep the authority with the local church in other words if you've developed a church to the point at uh, that stage of your missionary ministry you have a local church and maybe the church is going to hire a preacher or something like that hopefully you can already have a board uh, a group of elders something like that and uh, you can uh, let them handle it and if they're donating the money through their offerings and uh, ties and offerings and things then they'll be able to uh, not only will they be able to they will know what the laws are they will know what you can do and what you can't do they will know what will be permissible and what won't be permissible they'll know what you have to watch out for uh, and in the end uh, I believe and I teach and uh, uh, I think it's proper they should pay their own employees a church there should so if you're going to have somebody work for you it'll be just for you and uh, in most cases hire them to come to do whatever the job is pay them and then that's it you don't have that ongoing uh, relationship and you'll be better off that way there are some cases where you might not have any choice uh, and uh, uh, then look for friends uh, that you hopefully have established by that time that can help you can guide you can give you uh, instructions and and all that a person who may be a, a business owner in that country that you've done some dealings with and say hey I'm gonna have to hire a guy to do this maybe watchman or guard or something of that nature well, what do we do how do we do that ask them to explain it to you and if you've established a friendly relationship with them they'll be happy to do it and they'll help you avoid the issues now I'm gonna take a little vignette there and tell you a story <laughs> I tell stories a lot uh, and uh, this story illustrates the problem we're talking about here. This fellow we knew was from Australia, uh, living in Colombia. He'd married a Colombian lady they'd met over there. I don't know, I think she was doing inner uh, exchange student or something like that. And he met her and they got married. Uh, well, she kind of wanted to go back and be close to mom and dad and all that and everything. Well, she talked him into moving back to Colombia with her. He got back there and he says, well, what am I gonna do? You know, uh, uh, can't really, uh, they won't let me work here because uh, uh, gotta have Colombians do everything. So, as a foreigner, it's pretty hard to get a job and work legally in the country. So, well, we're gonna start a sporting goods store. Uh, we were out in the jungle prairie region. There were getting to be enough wealthy people to go fishing and stuff like that. He said, "Well, that's probably a good idea," and and it actually was it worked out pretty good for him. Starts his sporting goods store. His wife owned it, of course, so that way uh, he avoided the labor laws himself and could do it. 
uh, he ran this sporting goods store. He was an outdoorsman and knew all about fishing and stuff like that. Not much hunting at that time because the gorillas were already starting to get to be bad out in the jungle. But uh, the rivers and stuff that were close by, we could still fish in them and, and that type of thing. So he started this sporting goods store. He's working away and everything. Well, they had a gummy, a street child, a street urchin, who uh, would uh, be sleeping in their doorway when they'd show up in the morning. Uh, they felt sorry for the kid, obviously, as you would. And so feeling sorry for this kid, they said, well, maybe we can help him out a little bit. So they start telling this little boy, he's, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 years old, something like that. He says, tell him, hey, you run this errand for me and I'll give you a little bit. Okay, fine. So he ran down, took this package over there or whatever it was, and they gave him a few pesos and you know, a day or two later, same thing here, run this over there, you know, take these papers, this office and everything, get them signed and bring them back. Okay, you ran over and did that and everything. Well, here you give them a few more pesos. And this went on for several months. Uh, everything seemed to be going fine. They were pleased that they were able to help him. Uh, they thought, well, you know, if this keeps going well, maybe we'll start paying for his school so he can go back to school, stuff like that. Uh, he was living in the streets, so they were saying, well, maybe we can find a place where he could uh, stay uh uh, you know, something, you know, they uh, thought about maybe taking him into their house, but they really didn't have all that much space yet. Uh, they were just kind of getting started and kind of hard up. So uh, they thought we were thinking about it, uh, working this over. Well, this worked out pretty good. And then one day they sent him somewhere with a little bit of money to buy something or wh whatever and uh, come back. <laughs> well, he took off and didn't come back, <laughs> at least not that day. Found him sleeping on the doorway the next morning. He says, hey, what happened? You know, well, he had taken off and spent the money on whatever he spent it on. And, uh, you know, they were getting him food and stuff like that and uh, all and uh, everything. Well, they said, well, you know, if you're not going to be honest with us, we're not going to have you work anymore and we're, you're done. Uh, we're not going to send you out on any more errands. So they said, we're not going to help you anymore. This guy, this kid goes around right down to the Oficina Laboral, the labor office or whatever, he says, hey, I'm working for this gringo over here. I call him gringo even though he's an Australian. I'm working for this gringo over there. I've been working for him all these months and, and all that. And, and, and now they just fired me. They owe me my severance pay. They owe me, you know, all this kind of stuff you got to give down there and uh, all that. And, uh, oh, okay, well, they called this guy in. Well, you're paying this guy's salary. No, we didn't. We just helped him out here a little bit there every now and then. But you did it over a period of so many weeks or months or whatever. Yeah, we've been doing it for you know, three, four months, six months, whatever it was at that time. Well, that constitutes a labor agreement. He was on your payroll, and I got to pay him. <laughs> they wound up having to give this kid a couple thousand bucks <laughs> uh, because they tried to help him out, and they didn't understand the custom. Now, his wife was a Colombian, but she had never been involved in hiring people and firing people and, and all that kind of stuff, and so she didn't know either. And she had been over in Australia long enough. She'd kind of developed that tender heart, too. So when you start working with people in other countries, you can get yourself into big trouble really quick. Because as the foreigner, there's always going to be the impression, you're rich, <laughs> you've got all sorts of money, and these people are poor, and they need whatever it is that you've got. And uh, so if you get into a labor disagreement, you're going to lose. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be expensive. And it's going to be difficult, and you might wind up getting thrown out of the country over it. So for all of those reasons, uh, you should avoid labor contracts. Now, beyond labor contracts, let's say, okay, you're not going to have to hire anybody. You're going to avoid that, that risk. You still have to get along with people. You still have to work with people in the church. You still have to avoid offending them. And the way to do that is start learning their culture, start learning their customs, start learning the nuances. Now, I already told you about how you stand close in Colombia to talk, how you generally touch the person if you're talking to them. That's normal down there. Those are the type of things you have to learn. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to talk about local dress, uh, modesty, uh, mannerisms, things of that nature. And at that point, I'll have a little bit more on some of these interactions and gestures and things of that nature. But what I want to deal with here is the fact that when you're working with them down there, almost everywhere in the world, except the United States, the person is more important than the thing, and the relationship is of consummate significance. In other words, you work to cultivate and to care for that relationship you have with them. Now, that affects everything. Now, we Americans believe in honesty. We got to tell the truth. 
And that even means if we're going to hurt someone or offend somebody, because the truth is more important than the person. But in most places of the world, they don't see it that way. And so if somebody over here asks me something or whatever, and, you know, it could be a lady saying, hey, you like my dress or something. I think it's the ugliest thing in the world. But if I say that, I'm going to hurt her. So I'd say, oh, yeah, very nice. Oh, it looks great on you, something like that. Um, cultivating that relationship and taking care of that relationship is more important than almost anything else. And so you take all that into consideration in everything that you do with that individual, uh, all of your interactions, how you speak with them, uh, things of that nature. For example, in Latin America, most of the time, orders will be given as suggestions. You don't say, go over there and do that. That's seen as abusive. That's seen as impositive. That's seen as, I don't care about you. You're a little peon and I'm just going to step on you there. Um, and so what they'll generally do is say, you know, uh, probably a good idea if you go over and do that job over there or something like that. Oh, okay. And off they'll run and do it. Uh, they take your suggestion as a work order, but it's been done in a way that it's considerate of them and of their feelings and uh, of their self-esteem and everything of that nature. And so those are the types of things that you have to work on. And that doesn't come quickly and it doesn't come easily. I'll tell you right now, you're going to make a few mistakes. I hadn't been in Colombia very long. We were moving out into the jungle, taking all of our stuff down there. I got one of the local Christians to help me with a horse cart. Now, this horse was going incredibly slow, and the time was going by, and I could see we weren't going to get this canoe unloaded uh, in daylight, and I was getting concerned about it and everything else. And I says, uh, can't you make the horse go faster? And, well, we're doing pretty fast. Well, not that. Well, uh, this uh, other young fellow that I knew out there that I'd met out in the jungle came along, and he had been helping us load it and everything, and and all that, and uh, the horse cart I had borrowed from someone. These two guys were just driving it. And uh, uh, so when we got ready to go back the next time, I told this younger guy, why don't you drive the horse cart? Okay. You know, so he gets on to, well, this other fellow was already offended because he was older, and he had been driving the horse cart, and he felt like I demoted him, which I guess I had. We're going along a little bit, and the horse going, faster because I did make this thing move. So he's, you know, using the whip a little bit every now and then getting the horse to move and we're honking on down the road and this thing and uh, moving along a little bit faster and all. And I just made the comment. I said, ah, I says, now things are going better. Something like, or now things are going faster. I think I said something like that. So older guy just said, goodbye. And he jumped off the court cart and he left. And I never got to the point where I ever restored my friendship relationship with that guy. I had hurt him, I had offended him, I had demoted him in his own eyes, uh, all of that. <laughs> well, we made the horse go quicker, but we're in the tropics, in the hot jungle. Uh, the horse went quicker for a little while, and then the horse was just overheated and fatigued and couldn't go on. And we had to get some other way to finish hauling the things from the canoe down at the river to the little house that I secured to live in. Now, the older fella knew he couldn't work the horse that fast. And that's why he was working him slow. He knew what he was doing. I thought he just wasn't making the horse go fast. Uh, I thought we could do it quicker. I didn't know. He did. I, to a degree, imposed my will over his will. And as a result, hurt his feelings. It's going to happen. When it does, say you're sorry. Do your best. Try to make it right and learn from it.